Speaking about private companies, I want to further this point. Arnie, you tweeted about uh, Databricks, and you said, we will know when it's a top in the AI bubble when Databricks goes public. Databricks last raised at $38 billion in February 2021. Google, Amazon, and Meta, I believe, participated in their fundraising round, and they just acquired a company called Mosaic ML for $1.3 billion, which, to my understanding, is trying to be their competitor to OpenAI, not just ChatGPT, but the entire LLM market. That's why they acquired that company. Um, so I guess two questions. Number one, any thoughts on the acquisition? And number two, why do you think it'll be an AI bubble top if they if they go public? Well, uh, I like to watch at uh, private transactions. In the market, you have uh, dumb money, smart money, with a general conception that uh, hedge funds uh, are smarter than uh, the the retail uh, like us, but in the reality, even within uh, the the market, there is uh, dumb money, including uh, institutional investors and funds, uh, and very smart fund money, including VCs uh, and uh, private equity. When uh, things were very bad uh, in, term, in terms of valuation, like December, we saw uh, skyrocketing activity from private equity. Private equity are the smart buyers. He and uh, venture capital are the smart uh, sellers, meaning that uh, VCs uh, will push the companies to go public when they realize that the valuation is actually so, uh, a bargain for them and for the company, because otherwise uh, you are not incentivized to, to sell part of uh, the company. So in order for an IPO to make sense, uh, it needs to be done at a very high price. From a company perspective, it's like having uh, an option. You have a, a call option on uh, your company. Do you want to exercise a company, uh, an option when it is uh, extremely valuable or uh, when uh, nobody really cares? So all this combination of, uh, of things, uh, the interest in uh, open AI, in AI in aggregate, uh, is stimulating transactions. Everyone wants to go there and... Uh, um, Databricks uh, buying a mosaic for uh, 20x the revenues for a company that is uh, still very early, um, a couple of years, gives a, a hint that uh, if we start intersecting this information with Palantir, which is obviously a leader, it is uh, obviously also intersecting the other trend we just spoke about uh, in the defense. That means uh, that the Valuation on Palantir is relatively expensive compared with its fundamentals, but uh, it is not overall expensive compared with a context uh, where it is. So my speculation is uh, Databricks is the most appealing uh, prospected IPO for uh, the AI software side. There is also ARM that uh, makes it uh, cheap. So that is probably more related to NVIDIA. But as we said before, um, in order to make a company public, what you do is uh, checking the comparables. When the comparables are hot, meaning uh, they have a very high multiple, you are incentivized to drop the IPO. So I speculate uh, the market uh, you know, of the AI will, uh, will be at a very mature phase of uh, the interest when uh, Databricks will uh, do the IPO for the simple fact that Databricks is a, a very good company. They yeah. have been grow, growing while uh, other companies were completely slashing their valuations. They just uh, trimmed the valuation. And uh, if they just wanted to have uh, some money to keep running until they are fully profitable, they have uh, that appeal that uh, makes, uh, makes them keep raising money. If they make an IPO, it means that the multiple is so high that the VCs don't want to keep funding <laughs> the company at that valuation. They just wanted to drop <laughs> the, the company at a very high valuation. So empirically, what you assist is that the IPOs of the biggest companies in a trend are typically the top of that cycle. And we have a lot of examples like Robinhood, perfectly timing the, the peak of the uh, retail uh, interest, uh, interest uh, trading. Uh, we have Rivian with uh, 
literally the top, I built it at 150 or something it was crazy I mean yeah. 150 billion for something that was basically pre-revenue <laughs> yeah and they literally timed the the highest multiple on Tesla so you see that this pattern the reference company on top of which uh, the company is valued having a very high multiple the hot IPO at the moment dropped exactly when uh, the multiple is uh, is stupid so I don't know when, but uh, when and if uh, the multiples of uh, Palantir and Snowflake, which from my understanding are the closest comparison uh, to Databricks, uh, will be hot. If they will be very hot, uh, that to me is a signal. Okay, the, the trend, the AI trend now is very mature. Probably the, the good has already on our past. Yeah. I agree. I mean, it was last valued at 38 billion. So if they were to go public right now, they'd probably be more valued at 25 billion. Um, and if they were to go to public, I, I don't know. I think they're doing a billion in revenue or something like that. Um, so if they, if that's the case, it's more than a 16 times price sale because Palantir is doing around 2 billion, something like that, 1.9 billion. So it, it would be a really pricey valuation right now. So I think I agree with you. It makes a lot of sense for them to wait. Um, and my then pure speculation up. is they will try to get to a hundred. I mean, well, ri well, Rivian was 150 pre revenue. Databricks actually was is uh, growing very well, it is uh, around uh, 1 billion run rate, growing at 60 percent. So it is very, very sellable. Everyone wants that uh, in the software world. So I know it's, it's extreme, but uh, we don't have to think uh, as investors. We need to think as uh, bankers who want to maximize value and uh, VCs who want to maximize value. So for them, since they don't have rush, unless they clearly drop a bomb, a complete scam to investors, uh, or for them, there is no incentive to just do the transaction. So one thing I want to talk about with Databricks, because I've had a little bit of experience with Databricks, not a lot, en enough of it to really be to be really dangerous and have a direct comparison between the two. But uh, obviously we use Foundry for a lot of our dynamic data that's coming in and changing almost within minutes, right? So I'm able to see something that happens 150 miles offshore and get that data within three to five minutes and be able to make decisions in, in kind of almost real time, right? While things are kind of going on. The, the thing that I've noticed, at least with how we've used Databricks within our organization at Undisclosed Oil Company, is it's more things that might be, while it's quick, it is, allows you to access data very quickly as well. I'd say the I don't see the long term AI capability of it. I do. But, you know, that that's like I said, I don't I don't have the, the in-depth knowledge or, or use cases of it yet. But the things that are useful are access to data that is very static. So something that might be updated once a day or once. Do you a week. use it daily, Matt? Like use Foundry? Do you use Databricks no. daily? No. So it's not uh, an operating system, you would say, for you. It's it's more of like an encyclopedia. That's something you might reference. Uh, at least that's how we've used it, right? So I I've only speak to how we've used it with an undisclosed oil company. Um, so it's something that. You know, it might be an encyclopedia of data, historic data that we've acquired over the past 20 years that is kind of like not something that needs to be updated very frequently um, versus a Palantir, which is being constantly updated multiple times a second with a bunch of different data points across an entire facility. So it, it, it's very differently used, at least from my perspective at the moment. I see the advantageousness of both, um, especially with Undisclosed Oil Company. At the moment, they don't really conflict each other. Um, but I don't see us building applications as much, at least yet, right? It's very new Databricks being involved in Undisclosed Oil Company. But I don't see us building brand new applications uh, and engines on top of a Databricks like we have with Foundry. And I don't know if that's just because we've been using Foundry for five to six years, and I've only really noticed Databricks being a thing over the past year with an undisclosed oil company. Um, so uh, I, I will keep a pulse on it and maybe discuss with, with some of my friends that are kind of part of the 
the central team that creates a lot of the Palantir products with an undisclosed oil company and see if there's a true um, strategy with both and what their thoughts are. And maybe I could relay that back if, you know, with full disclosure of, of saying, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm, really curious and i've talked about this on podcasts and and they all know i do the podcast as well so um anyway just thoughts there 